What's up guys, Dr. Antonio Webb here. I am in Houston, Texas. We're about to meet with Dr. Rowe. She's a physician here who started her own practice, the Honeycomb Clinic. We're gonna check that out. So if you're a medical student, resident, fellow, attending, and you're looking to start your own practice, this video is for you. Welcome yeah. to Honeycomb. Thank you, appreciate it. Awesome, let me show you around. So here is our entrance room, reception area for our patients. Christabel is speaking to someone right now. This, believe it or not, used to be a storage closet. And when I renovated the building, I decided I wanted to put a kitchen and workout area in the practice. And so I really believe that for medicine to change and go from sick care to health care, uh, we really have to incorporate health and fitness into the actual um, practice. So we do yoga classes, we do ev every Saturday Zumba classes. It's been phenomenal use of the space. I never forget um, an investor I was pitching said, well, isn't this space a waste of money? I said, I said, not to me, because it's about the return on investment. When my patients come in here, their phones are out. They cannot wait to post pictures on Google mm. and write a Google review and say, look at my doctor's office. Yeah. So if you don't have the business sense to see that that's not a waste of money, well, I can't help you. The biggest question that I get a lot and what a lot of students don't understand going into training, which I didn't understand either, is mm -hmm. overhead. Can you talk about how daunting that was to just take on this huge project, make ends meet and also pay my employees, yep. pay my staff, the rent, the space, like yep. can you talk a little bit about that? The overhead for medical practice is significant. I usually say on the low end, you have to budget at least 200000 for your first year. And um, that's if you're in a small office. Yep. This is a huge space, yep. right? How many square feet? With, this is a 10,000 square foot wow. building, right? With uh, 12 employees, uh, contractors and employees. And it's not just the cost of running the business, right? When your your light bill is 1500 like. Mm -hmm. your, your water bill is a thousand dollars um your marketing expense there's a lot that goes into it and earlier i mentioned you need to get a loan because you are going to consistently lose money before you make any so um if you're not prepared to take that risk you're not going to be able to reap the re rewards and we have 16 exam rooms our rooms are handicap accessible, awesome. which you know as a spine surgeon is yeah. extremely important. Beautiful uh, space here. Um, what made you name it the Honeycomb Clinic? And what, what does that mean? So that's a great question and I get it all the time. So you know and I know when it comes to medical school, residency training, it's survival of the fittest, right? We're taught to compete against each other. Who's the best medical student? Who's the best resident? And to me, I thought, you know, if we only work together the way bees work together in the colony, right? Sure. There, there are no egos. It's not who's the best bee here. It's how do we best serve the colony? So when I thought about honeycomb, when you look at an actual honeycomb, they're individual hexagon units. Mm -hmm. Any of those units alone would be weak. But when you connect them, there's the strength. Yeah. So the strength is bringing doctors together, and that's what Honeycomb means to me. That's awesome. You know, anything in medicine, it's all about teamwork. You know, the housekeeper, the dietitian, the person that picks up the linen from the patient's room. Everybody's important to take care of the patient. I think that's uh, that's a great illustration of just your kind of your vision. What gave you the vision to start something like this? Because when I think about starting a medical practice, it can be very daunting for a lot of people. And there's not a lot of information out there, how to start your practice, how to get a business alone, you know, the just the setups, but the whole clinic, like, have you always wanted to start your own practice? It's, it's so interesting you say that. I just want to be a doctor. You know, that's all I've ever wanted to do, take care of people. But what I found is in medicine, too often in large corporations, it's not about the patient. So I felt like this was the only option, start my own practice or not practice medicine, because I wasn't going to show up every day and just produce revenue for people. It was profits over patients, and it wasn't one institution, it was everywhere you go. See a patient in 10 minutes, how? How can I, as a primary care doctor, 
handle multiple medical problems, document, review records in 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah. And across the board, it's what's happening. So to me, it was it was necessity. Like I had to do this or I would never be able to wake up every morning and say, I love my job. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. You know, that's fortunately the way medicine is going. And um, I, I hear about a lot of physicians. It's usually sometimes a couple of different things that just sets them on fire and like, hey, I'm gonna start my own practice. Was there one particular thing that maybe your previous job that said, hey, I'm done with this, I'm, I'm gonna start my own thing? So, so when it comes to Honeycomb, there was a very specific motivator to do this. And it was because I was renting space for my previous practice in a hospital. Mm -hmm. And in the height of COVID, I was doing a um, hundred COVID tests per day. Wow. Uh, seeing patients, busy practice. We show up to work one day mm -hmm. and the hospital's closed. No one notified us, the doctors, the tenants of the hospital. So if there's a, a, a specific reason I started Honeycomb Clinic, yeah. it was that. Doctors shouldn't wake up one day and, and find out, no one told you, you don't have a place to work anymore. Yeah, I, I can see how that would be very frightening uh, just to uh, learn about that. Um, if, if there are medical students out there, resident, fellow, or even attendings like myself, uh, three actionable items to start your own practice, what would you say? Um, so number one, have a great lawyer. Okay. Um, don't start the process without consulting an attorney because the mistakes you might make without an attorney could be very costly okay. in the long run. Little things like what's the difference between an LLC and a PLLC, yeah. right? Because if you don't have the PLLC, there's certain things you should or should not be doing. Um, two, actually get a loan. Mm. And that is a hard thing to tell someone that has six yeah. figures in debt. Yeah, how many banks told you no? Uh, many. Yeah. In, yeah. Fact, yeah. in fact, the bank that I got the loan from told me no. And <laughs> the reason I share that is you hear people say it's not what you know, it's who you know, and that's true. And I had the right people backing me to go back to the bank and said, if you don't give her the loan, here's where I'm gonna take her. So um, you will hear no over and over again. It's not yet. It's not actually no, it's not yet. And the third thing I would say is find the right team um, because you are the physician, um, whether you own the practice or not, you cannot be in the practice and running the practice all day. But if you have the right people around you supporting you, you can be the owner and focus on bringing in enough patients mm -hmm. to feed everyone. But if you're trying to be the COO, do the financials, do the marketing, do everything, well, guess what? Now, instead of seeing 20 patients a day, you can only see 10 or you can only see five and you have missed out on revenue opportunities. So find a good lawyer, find the funding. If it's not a loan, if you have family and friends that want to invest, a lot of my family and friends invested in my practice. And then also making sure you, you build the right team from, from the start. If people out there, all these different steps and processes that you have to set in place, are there companies that you can hire to help you just get it off the ground? Absolutely, um, but I would say start with your local medical association. Most medical associations have a business startup, um, especially if you're in Texas, they, they definitely have one. And the thing is, most of us pay our medical association dues for CME, mm -hmm. but there's a lot more than CME that you are not um, able that you're not taking advantage of. And the reason I recommend that is because there are a lot of companies out there that will take advantage of you mm. that actually don't know how to start a practice. They just know how to build a good website and convince you that they can. And then it's not until you're knee deep in, you realize these people don't actually know what they're doing. But when it's your medical association, they, they have their reputation on the line and they have to vet these people and make sure the people helping you actually know what they're doing. Don't just look at the cost because it may seem cheaper to go with this option that you found on Google, but <laughs> go with the credible source and you'll save in the long run.
So uh, we also have our own lab on site. One thing I learned from working from four large corporations is you don't want the patient to leave, right? So it was very important to me to have doctors working in medical office buildings and their patients have to go here for the lab, yep. here for the x-ray, here for something else. We want it to be so convenient for the patient they come to Honeycomb. So this is our lab. Wow. Um, we do all of our patients' routine blood work. We also do viral testing, COVID testing, strep test, um, any type of test that they might need, we can do in-house and the patient never has to leave the office. So it's kind of like a one-stop shop once mm -hmm. they come to your office, get their yep. blood drawn. Yep. And also I understand you guys have a MRI. Yes, so that's, that, incredible. that's the thing. And it's an open MRI. So yeah. a lot of yep. people are intimidated about getting an MRI because they're like, I don't want to be in that machine. And they come here and there's this huge open MRI and they're like, I can't believe you have an MRI in your office, but. Yep, so we have an MRI on site. We get a lot of referrals from ortho doctors like yourself and who want to read their own images. Uh, and we're able to get the patients taken care of right here in the office. So it's really been amazing. Personal injury attorneys send patients to us. So open MRI here in the That's office. incredible. Yeah, I order as a spine surgeon probably about 10 MRIs a day. So uh, to have it in the same office, I mean, that's almost unheard of. This is, this is incredible. Yeah. So you're a family medicine physician by training, mm -hmm. um, but I also know that you have your MBA. Yep. So a lot of questions that I get and I always wonder myself, is it, was the MBA worth it? Because whenever I'm thinking about different investments or just different educational paths, I always worry about the, or take into consideration the ROI. Mm -hmm. Do people need to get an MBA to run a practice like this? I would say the majority of doctors do not need an MBA. If you simply want to own your own practice, I usually recommend taking a few business courses. Mm -hmm know how to read a profit and loss, know how to balance a checkbook. Some of us were never taught that. Take an accounting course. You don't need to sacrifice two years of your life. However, if you want to build something on the level of honeycomb, yes, the MBA would be helpful because this is not a single practice. This is something we're going to scale nationwide and internationally. So you're gonna need a different skill set than just running a practice. For me, it was absolutely worth it because you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And once my eyes were opened, I went from being a physician that went to business school to being a business person that went to medical school. And it's a different game. Like the way I look at things, I'm always crunching the numbers. Um, even from a customer service perspective, knowing about sales, operational processes, marketing, I have this whole tool bag that I can use to be successful in my practice. So if a marketing group comes to me um, to make a proposal and they wanna charge me $10,000, I'm tearing it apart. But I'm doing that because I took marketing classes, right? If a accountant comes to me and says, well, you know, here's what we're doing for your books. Hey, I don't think that takes 10 hours. Yeah. Sh show me why. So for me, it was invaluable, but I do think that we have to consider, we as physicians have a late start in life, right? We sacrifice eight, 12, how many years of training, Dr. 14, Webb? 15, 14, 15 yeah. years, you know, it's time for you to earn a living. Yeah. So if you're going back for an MBA, you have to go with intention and purpose. Yeah. This is how I'm going to use this degree because some of us get addicted to school yeah. and we get addicted to titles and what titles mean to the world versus what is this actually going to use for me? So my ROI is going to be completely different than the ROI for someone else. If you want to be a hospital executive, it can also be very helpful in that um, respect. But I'll tell you, there are a lot of hospital executives who do not have an MBA. There are a lot of people who own large medical um, groups nationally who don't have an MBA. Research the companies you work for and see who started them. Nine times out of 10, they may have had a doctor as a partner, but it wasn't the doctor that started the business. So you don't need it. But if you have a plan and a purpose and you execute and you utilize it, then it's worth it and the ROI will be there. 
Yeah, that's some great advice. Um, and just speaking about an MBA and other businesses that you have, can you talk about some of those other ventures outside of the Honeycomb Club? Absolutely. One of um, the most recent ventures is my scrub store, Statement Scrubs. That's welcome. And um, thank you. I, I was not planning to open a scrub store. I'd always had this idea that I wanted to create a scrub line. Um, the scrubs are made for you, Dr. Webb, no disrespect, right? <laughs> Tall men. And here I'm, I am a, a short, curvy female and my, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so thankfully the um, scrub world has evolved. It's become more fashionable, but I, I have a joke that figs were made for twigs, right? They're not made for me. <laughs> and uh, we sure. still have room. So I actually went to Vietnam, did research on the manufacturing world. And um, I think there's a whole market that is is ripe and ready for um, to bring more diversity into the scrub space where we can um, express ourselves through our um, scrubs. And so we started Statement Scrub Store last July, um, already profitable um, within our first year. And what we see is that People enjoy supporting women in business. They like um, purchasing from someone that they are aligned with. But even more importantly, um, one of the motivators to start this scrub business was to give back. Mm -hmm. There are medical students and residents in a daunting amount of debt. And I thought, hey, if these scrub companies are worth five billion, why aren't they giving scholarships? Yeah. They literally make money off our backs. Literally. Um, so I committed when I started my scrub store that I would give 5% back to medical student scholarships. We've already contacted Howard, Meharry, and um, Morehouse to donate white coats to the next class. And so it's more about how do we use, if, we, if we're earning, how do we give back through through our attire? So everything we use is an opportunity to give back. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Incredible. Um, you're a very busy person, I can just tell, <laughs> especially with all your businesses and outside adventures. What is like a typical day for you? I know it probably varies by the day. My days vary by the yeah. day, evening, minute, hour. I watch your day in the life video, yeah. so so you're busy too. But um, typical day for me, I always start my day out with um, intention. So with prayer and exercise, because that sets the tone for the day. Once that's um, done, I'm getting my son ready. We're going um, drop off school drop offs, going to, to the office straight from office to pick up my son and spend some quality time with him. As physicians, we work very long hours and it's very important that you carve that time out to have work life balance. And, you know, then you start over and do it again. But at the end of the day, as busy as I am, I have made a point in my life to never be too busy for the things that matter. So sometimes people reach out to me like, hey, I need this, you know, do you have time? You make the time for what's important. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, next five years, 10 years for Honeycomb, what, where do you see it going? So absolutely, um, we've already started, re we started researching for the next honeycomb when I started honeycomb right. because I knew well. it wasn't going to be a one and done for me. So I actually partnered with the University of Houston. We um, did research on three cities I thought would be next. Um, we had the data. So we had, yeah. So the three we're looking at Miami, Atlanta, and New Orleans. No San Antonio? <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Uh, but um, with that being said, so we're, we're getting really close to outgrowing this space and we are looking at the, the next opportunity. But five to 10 years from now, where I see Honeycomb, we want to be in at least 10 major cities and hopefully also taking it international. You know, I've been to Ghana, I've been to South Africa, I am Jamaican. So seeing that there's a need for healthcare in so many places and this model is so unique, I wanna take it as far as we can. Yeah. Well, Dr. Rowe, thank you so much for showing us around and uh, very nice to meet you. I'm inspired by your story and what you've built here. Um, if patients want to see you or if anyone wanted to get in touch with you, how would they do that? Definitely, you can find us online at thehoneycombclinic.com and we're on all platforms. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, um, and connect with us. We wanna take care of you and your families. All right, guys, Dr. Webb here. Thank you guys for watching this video. 
Make sure you subscribe. We have lots of new content coming out and we'll see you soon.